go. Streaming from South Africa to the world. To the world. This is the Stonks Go Moon podcast. What just happened? We break it down so you don't have to. Welcome everyone to the Stonks Go Moon podcast. Our guest today, David Garrett, CEO and founder of Devon. Welcome to the pod. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, now I have to do this little thing where I go. David Garrett is an entrepreneur with 25 years of experience spanning technology and the wine industry. He's the co-founder and CEO of Devon Labs, a company that uses blockchain technology to tokenize the wine asset class, bringing transparency and innovation to the one trillion luxury wine market. Devon Labs also launched the Devon Protocol and the seller challenge to engage wine enthusiasts and integral digital assets with traditional wine collecting that, 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 so, well, that's about sums it up right that's that's something really wonderful written by my unbelievably <laughs> great um, press relations team uh, that's that's fantastic but look it's it's actually much simpler than that like yeah we we take wine uh-huh. especially like luxury and investment grade wine okay and we tokenize it which turns it from being a possession into an asset, right? What's the biggest like a challenge? Possession. Yeah, so what's the biggest challenge in doing that? Because you're taking like a traditional industry, like the wine industry. I mean, if there's something that I know about the wine industry is they do not like, yeah, some of them, you, the, your smaller boutique estates, they will bring in modern technology and stuff, but they are not really fans of change. Sure, I mean, look, I've been, I, I was a tech guy yeah. um, and I sold my company and, you know, dumped it all into a vineyard and a winery in Argentina, <laughs> right? Like that's what you're supposed to do. And, and, um, and so I've been in the wine business for 25 years. Yeah. And I remember when I started in like, you know, 2004, 2005, um, you know, we would, I, I, well, we were building the winery. I was making friends with other winemakers all mm-hmm. around Argentina. And we were talking to them about a web. We were like, we're building a website. We're going to like put some information about your wine on it. And they were like, why would you need a website? Like, why does a winemaker, why would a winemaker need a website? Um, and one of the things I say all the time is like the, the, the wine industry is single-handedly keeping the clipboard industry in business, right? <laughs> because they keep all their records on clipboards. You know, when yeah, you walk in, like all their up, inventory, yeah. all the information, like it's all on a clipboard. <laughs> yeah. And um, and like, that's great. But what I'll tell you is the wine industry um, is is uh, absolutely they're resistant to change and they're mm-hmm. certainly resistant to technology. Mm-hmm. But there's something really interesting happening in the wine industry right now, which is a big generational shift um so there's two actually there's there's two important things that are happening one is this generational shift which is that um the the boomers and generation x are starting to buy less wine Mm. and the millennials are starting to buy more and the millennials what's interesting about the millennials is they're the first generation that's like digital first And what you saw over the course of the last 25 years is that as the millennials just started participating in different industry categories, those categories started having digital transformations. Hmm. Um, You know, they started doing more digital advertising. They started doing more direct to consumer sales. They started connecting with consumers. They started offering more experiences. They basically started like you, you kind of, it's like a little wave, you know, you saw it as the millennials like started getting into fashion, you saw fashion like start to embrace technology. Mm-hmm. And as they started getting into like, like, like cars, you started seeing cars really start to, to embrace technology and then real estate. And now really it's wine um, okay. and wine is next. And what you see is there's these two converging forces one is this generational change both in the consumers and in the winemakers right like the winemakers of today their parents weren't so into technology 
but they but the, but the younger generation, like they were born on their phones. <laughs> mm. So they know how other businesses work and they know how to connect. So they're more interested in taking advantage of technology. Uh, okay, so we're talking about tokenizing wine as an asset. Why do you differentiate between regular wine and investment grade wine? So wine is is a giant industry, right? Yeah, it's uh, $485 billion, dollars, uh, which is about the same size as the airline industry, Jeez. right? Big, big, big business. Um, I say all the time, you know, if you took the global film industry and the global television industry and the mm -hmm. global recording industry and the global newspaper industry and the global publishing industry and the global video game industry, and you put them all together, it would still be smaller than the global wine industry. And and the reason that I mention all those things yeah. is those are all discretionary purchases, right? Mm. Like when you buy, when you go to a movie or television, like those are discretionary purchases. Mm. It's mm. not food or shelter. Yeah. And wine is the same way. It's like a discretionary purchase, but it's a giant asset. It's, a, it's just a big, big industry. Well, some people- What some we're people really focused on I mean, yeah, that's right. And pe but people buy a lot, right? Yeah. People, but... people like a lot. There are many countries in the world that are drinking wine every day. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they have a bottle of wine on their table every night at dinner. Yeah. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about. The yeah. wine that we're tokenizing is considered luxury or investment grade wine. Yes. And that's a smaller sliver to be sure, but it's still about a hundred billion dollars a year, okay. which is still a very, very big business. Okay. And then if you look at the investment grade wine, which are wines that that actually have a secondary market, yes, that's about ten billion dollars a year. But those wines hang out for a long time, right? There's mm. ten billion dollars of of new investment grade wine made every year, yeah. but there's about at any given time there's about three hundred billion dollars worth of investment grade wine in the marketplace. Has that so around it's a really big asset class, you know, like 10, 15 years, twenty years, maybe ten, fifteen, thirty. 50 yeah, years. Yeah. We just yeah. tokenized a 1970 wine from Graham's Port. 1970. Yeah. Right. So um, I read online and I didn't have time to verify this, but there's some investment wines that have outperformed gold. Um, what can you, what sort of can you tell me about that? Sure. So you can look at the, so LiveX is a company that kind of keeps track of, okay. um, of pricing and you can go and look at their indices and their long-term basket of investment grade wine mm -hmm. has outperformed gold and the S P over the last 30 years. Wow. Um, with less volatility. So, and it kind of makes sense, right? Like mm -hmm. especially investment grade wine, there's a forced scarcity there. Yeah. Usually by geography, yes. but also, but also by regulatory, right? Like most wine regions that make investment grade wine, they have really specific rules about how much wine you can make. Yeah. So as you see more and more wealthier people, mm -hmm. the amount of wine is the same. Mm -hmm. So that's why the price has gone up. Interesting. What happens to wine that goes off? Like, from let's say incorrect storage conditions or cork taint or something like that, what what happens then to that investment? So, so that's actually a problem that we're trying to solve, right? Oh. Um, so a lot of times, and that's a big problem, right? Yeah. So wine yeah, yeah, yeah. needs to be stored <clears throat> and transported with correct um, temperature and humidity conditions mm. or it goes bad. Mm. And if you're in the industry, if you're like a sommelier or you own a wine shop, what you know is that about one in 10 bottles mm. ends up going bad, yeah. ends up being poured down the drain. So if you look at a hundred billion dollar industry, That's a lot of wine. one in 10 bottles, you know, that means, you know, yeah. $10 billion a year. It's a $10 billion problem. Yeah. What we're building, if anyone has heard of a, what, of a deep hit. So a, there's a, there's a kind yes. of a new interesting concept called deep in which is a decentralized um physical infrastructure network deep mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. and what that is is a um it's an incentivized network of devices that are connected to the internet and connected to the blockchain mm -hmm. that can interact with smart contracts yeah so what we do is we put a smart contract on every bottle and like an RFID sticker on every bottle. Okay. 
And that way, as the bottle moves through the supply chain, these devices can log, can, can, can actually record to the blockchain the location, temperature, and humidity conditions of that bottle. Interesting. So over time, you'll be able to like pick up a bottle, scan it with your phone, yeah. and you'll be able to see the chain of custody all the way from the winemaker to you and and see all of those temperature conditions and humidity conditions so you'll know oh that bottle was was properly stored and properly um yeah uh, properly transported or it wasn't that's and so that cool. we think solves a 10 billion dollar problem that's so cool and and, um, and how hmm. awful is it to pour wine down the drain yeah. nobody wants to do that yeah no one wants to do that talking about sort of the experience with wine and um wine is a very intimate um experience um usually among people if you should never well i want to say you should never drink alone when you're in my company now so it's fine you're not technically drinking alone. um <laughs> i i do but, my best to you, to, to never drink alone <laughs> but but i can't i can't always but i can't always achieve you can't your promise goal. you can't promise yeah, anything right. but like so my point being that you're bringing digital and NFTs and stuff like that into a an, an experience that's very personal. How do you reconcile these two things? So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question in two ways. The first oh. way was, as we were developing the technology, mm. what I told everyone from the beginning, all of our developers, all of our all of our UX designers, was we wanted to create a user experience where someone could get in and out as fast as possible mm -hmm. and go back to drinking wine with their friends, right? Like I wasn't interested in building like a sticky, like everyone would come to me and like, hey, I know if I we did this, this, it'll be more sticky. And I'm like, I don't no. want it to be more sticky. I want people to get in and out and like go back to drinking wine with their friends. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first thing we did. And the second thing that we did was, you know, because most people share wine with their friends or mm -hmm. with important people in their lives, and especially when you're drinking a great bottle, you're mm -hmm. typically like sharing that on a special occasion. Yes. There's an occasion, and so yes. we developed um, a, a really cool uh, mechanism where when you open a bottle, mm -hmm. you can claim what's called a tasting token, which is like, an authentic proof of experience I've tasted from that bottle. Okay. But then you can also share that with all of the people that you're tasting the bottle with. Like so everybody gets a little token. Yeah. And once we launch our, our native token, once we launch VinCoin, everyone will get a little bit of VinCoin okay. that tasted from that bottle. And that kind of creates a, a, a little bit of a fun social experience. And more importantly, now you can track all of the great wines that I had and who you drank it with. So it's like your wine journal mm. um, where you can see like all of the all of the great wine experiences. Completely makes sense to me. It's like you're collecting memories. Last question exactly. before I let you leave. <clears throat> you're in Barcelona, so you're in Europe. I know there's a lot of um, issues, I guess, uh, I saw in France that pulling out vineyards, some people say it's a lack of demand. Other people say it's sort of um, cl a climate issue that they can't, like, the, um, a sort of, it's not sustainable anymore. I mean, the, both of those things afterwards, after our conversation now, they sort of play into your business model because it's creating scarcity. But is that something that you're conscious of going forward? Sure. So, look, um, there is an awful lot of wine in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of this generational change mm -hmm. is that you're seeing more and more or fewer millennials yeah. are drinking wine in the same way that their parents did, meaning less of them have a bottle of wine every day on the table for lunch or for dinner, right? Yeah. So you're seeing less and less of that. So your less expensive wines, your dollar, like the vast majority of wines in the world are $1 a liter, right? Like very, very inexpensive. Yeah. You're seeing much less of that, right? Mm -hmm. Those wines, yeah. there's a glut of those wines on the market. Yeah. But when you look at luxury wines or investment grade wines, wines that kind of have an experience in and of themselves, the more expensive wines, the spines where it's like, the wines where it's like, this is a, a special experience. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is that those wines are becoming more and more scarce 
because more and more people can afford them and um, and they're becoming more expensive and more in demand. So, and because there's only a very small area where you can make those wines, um, that's why you've seen the prices go up. So while in the greater, in the in the kind of big category of um, of like uh, very very inexpensive wines, you're seeing volumes go down and demand go down. Yes. For luxury wines or investment grade wines, you're seeing demand go up and prices go up. Fascinating, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. If the listeners want to go and find out more about Divin and connect with yourself, where can they do that? Uh, divinlabs.com uh or divin labs on everywhere you know if they want to find us on on twitter (laughs) or linkedin or i don't know i think my guys even maybe did a tiktok i'm not sure (laughs) but if you just look for divin labs you'll find us we're easy i will put all the links in the comments david thank you so much for joining me and to the listeners yeah of course peace love and prosperity and we'll catch you in the next